Good morning, everyone. Good morning, people of God, and good morning to those of you that are watching with us this morning. We want to say and declare today is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So today, as we have the opportunity once again to give glory to our God, can we just give all our best this morning? I would like to encourage all of you. Let's worship God this morning as if like this is our last Sunday and Jesus Christ is going to come within two hours. <laughs> and so may I ask all of you to please stand with me. And uh, let's look to God in prayer and uh, hallelujah. Father, we thank you. For the opportunity once again to just, uh, we could gather together in your house, Father, to praise and worship you in spirit and in truth, O oh God. Lord, we thank you, God, for this opportunity once again, Lord, that after a week, Lord God, of toiling and working, O oh God, and being preoccupied, Father, and uh, being about everything, O oh Lord, that we could just gather ourselves together here, O oh God, and lay down before you everything once again. Because you said, Jesus, Lord God, in your word, okay, that we cast all our cares upon you because you care for us. So today, Father, would you release upon us a spirit of praise and worship that is filled with awe and glory? Father, we pray that we would just fall in love with you once again today, refreshed by your Holy Spirit. We pray that as we praise and worship you together with your children all over the world, O oh God, in different tribes and tongues and nations, O oh God, and time zones, we ask and we pray, Father God, that may it fill, Lord God, the chamber of your presence, Almighty God. Father, and as you go, go Lord, look down upon us, O oh Lord, our prayer, Father, is that would you be gracious to us, would you come and meet us, O oh Lord, and and Father, once again, we thank you, we honor you, and we give you glory, and this we pray in Jesus' most precious name. And all the people of God will say, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah.
Psalm 116.7 says, Let my soul be at rest, for the Lord has been good to me. And Romans 8.28 talks about how God makes everything work for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So whether you're in a season of blessings where you really feel God's hand moving mightily in your life, or maybe you're being led through trials of fire, God is always good, and he's always faithful for all of our lives. I love you, Lord. All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful So, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God All my life, all my life you have been faithful All my life
Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From the throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt and being the ruler over all. Thank you that we can trust that you are good in every situation and you're always faithful. And thank you so much that um, you were willing to give up your life for us and for the sake of the Father and that you gave us the Holy Spirit to comfort us um, once you rose again. And thank you so much that we can worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. It is good to be in the house of God. Amen. 
want to greet everyone with you once again. A pleasant morning. Hey, listen, can you just look around you and just wave at the people around you and say, I'm here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much, worship team. Uh, we'd just like to welcome Elizabeth back to, uh, the, you know, to our church. <laughs> She's been away for quite some time going to school, and um, yeah, I guess it's their break, and so we just want to welcome back our worship team. And thank God for the presence of God this morning. So once again, we'd like to welcome all of you to the house of God, as well to those that are watching with us. Uh, to those of you that would like to get to know more about the church, our website is jilfnj.org. We do have our Facebook, we do have our YouTube. You can share, you can like, and you can subscribe. And of course, once again, we would like to remind every one of you that we do have a prayer chain going on. Um, for the longest in the history of this church, I'm as close to about two years now, from uh, 7 to 8 p.m., from Monday to Saturday, men and women over the phone, and on Wednesday we do have that uh, Zoom prayer meeting or FB uh, messenger uh, meeting, but every day we do have that 7 to 8 p.m. We pray and we ask God to come and intervene upon our nation upon the lives of people because the only way we can see ch true changes in the lives of people is through the power of God. And so please join us. And if do, you do have your prayer requests, kindly um, post them on our social media. Give us a call. Uh, or you can fill up our prayer request slip right here and just drop them on the tithes and offering box. We would love to agree with you that you will receive your blessing as well as your miracle and prayer requests. We do have our daily encouragement as well. It's called Timely Truth, a Monday to Saturday on our Facebook and YouTube. And uh, so if you could just uh, would like to follow us. And of course, that's, that's uh, men and intended to encourage men and women, uh, everyone from all walks of life. November 24th, of course, uh, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, okay, um, we, are, we are changing the hour of people coming here. Instead of 10.30, please come here at 11.30. Uh, we just got a message uh, from, uh, from the OCVTS OC that we need to pick up the food from where uh, they're packing it. And so it will take us probably at least um, 45 minutes to do that back and forth. So we'll probably be here before 11.30. So please, to those of you that will be joining us, uh, be here at 11.30 this coming Wednesday. Uh, we have about 500 uh, uh, packed foods that we're going to give out as a Thanksgiving meal to our community. Now, to those of you that may not know, these are the areas that we usually target, Freedom Village, of course, and also the Raynor right here behind us, the mobile home. We do have one of the biggest mobile home uh, community uh, right to our, with our neighborhood and friendly village. We do have a surf and sand uh, right up by the 571. And there's a new mobile development that is by Jackson. It's about 5, 10 minutes from here. So we are targeting at least four or five. And there's another, another one by Route 9. So about five or six mobile home. And usually what we do is we knock on the door. And, you know, we greet him happy Thanksgiving with a smile, of course. And, um, you know, as we hand over the Thanksgiving meal, we ask them this simple question. Do you have anything that we could pray with you and agree with you in prayer? And you'll be surprised how people respond to that. They either break down, they're, they're joyful, or they will just say, thank you. We'd like, uh, you know, we, we need prayer so much. And so please come and join us because we need to love the community where God has planted us. Do you agree with that? Hallelujah. Also, we want to thank every one of you that have given your treasure for the Samaritan's Purse Christmas boxes. Out of the 100 boxes that we distributed, uh, 92 boxes were returned. And so we were able to bring it back to uh, the, drop, uh, the drop center. And of course, also the box of oranges are now here. I think there's about 100 cases, and many of you have already taken your, your cases, but there's still plenty here. If you have signed up and you have paid for it, they do have the, the oranges by the room and take them after the service. Of course, I'd like to hand over this one to uh, Gina. Good morning, Jesus is Lord Fellowship. This is Sister Gina. And I just wanted to um, 
come before you this morning and say thank you so much for everyone that volunteered for the uh, J Kids and Youth um, movie night that we had Friday night. We had a lot of children that came Ooh. out. That's our uh, group picture that we did. The children had an awesome time. Thank, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Whatever capacity that you volunteered in, we just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We cannot do this without you. From the food to the pictures to just uh, being on staff to just kind of watch everyone or just, you know, be there. We just want to say thank you. And um, I think that's it. And we'll look forward to the next event. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye-bye. Amen. Yeah, we appreciate the children's ministry, the leadership of Sister Gina Sterlinda. They have been doing an excellent job in just really, really engaging the community, the kids as well, as well as the youth ministry. So, praise God. Hey, listen, can we just uh, once again acknowledge them? Thank you. Thank you so much, children's ministry team. Um, thank you once again for your continuous support of the ministry as well as your faithfulness with your giving. Of course, we know that some of you are giving by either by mail or you can drop it at the offering box or by online, jilfnj.org. And I want to share to you about giving this morning in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. It says, And now I entrust you to God and the message of His grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. Talking about Paul, the apostle, Paul, the missionary, as well as his team. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Can you say that with me, please? So when he had finished speaking, he knelt down and prayed with him. Now, in this same chapter was also actually the, the moment when he knew that he would go to Rome and never will they see him again. So he was exhorting uh, you know, the, the people uh, in his time to really remember that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And the truth is this, giving carries its own reward. Do you know the people that even if they don't come to church, and they may not even believe the word of God, because principles, uh, spiritual principles are immutable. That means to say they're transcendence. Whether you are believer and unbeliever, if you practice the, the biblical principle knowingly or unknowingly, you harvest uh, you know, the fruit of that principle. So when you are on the giving side, it carries its own reward. Here's a few things that we can learn about the giving. Spiritually mature people know the law of the farmer. We reap in measure to that what we sow. Uh, one of the most neglected industry is farming because we think that it's just really a very laborious and difficult job. But really, farmers are one of the most intellectual people because they read the, you know, the season, they know when to plant, when to harvest. They just know how to you know, connect and collaborate with, uh, well, with the nature. Uh, with, uh, with the nature. And, and they know what, the, what they reap. They recognize that they will harvest that. Second is, you do not sow to obligate God. We just saw and know that God honors our obedience to His truth. You don't give because you want to twist the arms of God or you demand something from the Lord. You just sow because you want to be obedient and just trust the Lord with all your heart that He's going to bless you and give you whatever your heart's desire is. Our motive is love, but our reward is in proportion to our generosity. So everything we do for the kingdom of God is this. It is always motivated by love. No more, no less. Because the kingdom of God is what? It is based on love. God is love. Remember, in heaven, we will be rewarded for what we gave, not for what we received. And this is something that would surprise many in the kingdom of God. To those that have sown little, little for the kingdom of God, of course, the principle is when you get into the next life, you will receive little of the reward. And so make sure that you know your season in life. On this earth, there, this is a season for us to sow and plant and nourish and cultivate so that when we get into heaven someday, you'll be surprised how the Lord is going to pamper you because you have done well good and faithful servant. Farmer's mindset is this, he reaps after he has sown, but for us, we reap more than we sow because of the grace of God. We can never, never outgive God. 
So would you stand with me, please? And we're going to pray for a tithes and offering. If you have given online, please put your hand where your hand is, uh, heart is. And to those of you that have your envelopes, uh, remember this. For every time you give to God, whether in envelope or online, what you give is an extension of who you are, not just of what you have. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for opportunities like this, that we can honor you with our tithes and an offering. We thank you, Lord, for the time, the talent, the treasure, the ability, the capability, even the opportunity, Father God, the timing, Lord God, of your blessing upon our lives. We thank you, Father, that in the midst, Lord God, of this waning post-pandemic, God, we who have sustained us physically, some of us, uh, Lord God, has been infected by COVID, but Lord God, by you sustain us, you strengthen us, Almighty God, and you have allowed us to be able to recover, to give us the opportunity continually to serve you, Lord. Bless every labor of our hands, O oh God. And to those that are struggling at this point of their life, we pray, Father, for divine intervention that provision be released over them. We pray that to those that are starting to, Lord, take off in their business, Father, that you give them the intuitive Lord God of entrepreneurship, creativity, Lord God, in their marketing. We pray, Father, that you bless them with press down, shaking together, running over. Bless the companies that our people are working with and working for, Almighty Father. And above all, at the end of each day, oh God, help us to look up at you and say, Lord, we thank you for you are faithful. Lord, once again, we thank you for the opportunity that we can give from the bottom of our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, to those of you that has been given the invitation card, today is the first Sunday of us receiving our invitation guard, uh, cards. And if you haven't received any of these cards, would you? we're giving out at least two. Uh, would you kindly raise up your hand so that our ushers can give, uh, can give you this? Now, I'd like to encourage all of you to take at least two today. Now, if you need more, of course, our ushers can give to you later. But please take at least two cards. And I'm just ex I'll just explain to you once you have your cards with you. Um, all these years, we have done this. We have three major uh, events for coming December, December 19, 24, and 31. December 19th is Community Christmas Celebration. As you all know, uh, this is a big, big, huge community welcoming uh, you know, for people around us, our friends, our relatives, our co-workers, and anyone that we have come across. And we bring them here, and you know, we just give them a, a, a powerful presentation of the gospel uh, through music, through testimony, and through the message. And we give everyone the opportunity to come to the altar, and hoping and praying that by the working of the Holy Spirit, they will have the opportunity not only to hear, but make that decision to receive Jesus Christ. Then after, after that, of course, we treat them to this incredible buffet of food. We're known in the community to be a, a buffet church. <laughs> and so, you know, we always say that if we don't get at them in their heart, we'll get them to their stomach. And, <laughs> and uh, it has always been successful. In fact, when I was posting this on the social media last night, someone responded and said, I remember the first time when I came to one of those events, I was so angry. He said it was raining, and my wife told me to go to this New Year's event. One and a half hours driving from our house, and I told my wife, he said, this will be the first and the last time you're going to invite me to this event and to this church. And then he said, as I came inside the church, I saw a different event. To make the long story short, he said, that was the history of us because the whole family came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So, <laughs> and it was like probably like about three years ago and that family are here now. They're serving the Lord and uh, they have become faithful uh, supporters of the kingdom of God through Jesus Lord Fellowship. So you'll never know. Please stand with me. We're going to pray. I want us all to be evangelists. I want us all to be connecting and relating to people around us. And uh, we're going to relate what we're going to do, this card, to the message for today. If you have your cards with you, would you just kind of lift them up? I want you to envision this with me, that every card that is in your hands represents a soul, 
accepting Jesus Christ, a soul that, that will be redeemed, a soul that will come into the knowledge and relationship with the Holy Spirit. That could be your parents, that could be your brothers and sisters, that could be your closest relatives or distant relatives. But let's believe. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to be sensitive. And if you see someone in your mind, a face, a car, a house, uh, a table in the office, an attendant uh, attend, uh, in a gas station, maybe that is the one where the Spirit of God is leading you to go and invite. So we're going to pray. Father, as we have this invite cards once again, we ask and we pray, God, that you would just order our steps, anoint the labors of our hands, we pray, Father, that you put the right words, Almighty God, and even the tone of our voice, so God, as we speak to people. Holy Spirit, we have done this over and over again. We have always partnered with you to lead us and to guide us and to inspire us, Lord God, as we go out into the community and sow the seeds of invitation. Our prayer today, Father, that as first Sunday, O oh God, is that you would give, you would lead us to the right people, to the right uh, family, to the right individual, O oh God. Father, our prayer today, God, is this, is that you will give us great harvest, as you have said, go into the world and preach the gospel, O oh God. And so we go out into the community, we harvest the souls that you have given for us, oh Almighty God, for your glory and honor, we do this, Almighty Father, and we're asking as well for a great harvest of souls once again that will come to know Jesus Christ and enter into your kingdom. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. I'd like you to turn your e-Bible or your Bible in Luke chapter 10, verse 30. And I have entitled the message today, Go and Do the Same. Say that with me, please. In Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 37, here's what it says. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling on a, on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him, beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan man came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Now, here's what Jesus Christ said. In conclusion to the parable, he says, then, then, then Jesus said, you now go and do the same. Father, I ask that you speak to us. Give us the insight of the heart, Lord God, of this despised Samaritan man. Give us, Lord, as well, the perspective, Father, of this priest, O God, and the assistant, Lord, and Father, give us the, the revelation of God, what, that, what it takes, O God, between Jerusalem, Lord God, and Jericho. Father, we ask and we pray that as we enter into this Thanksgiving and Christmas season, that you would allow us to understand, O God, that everyone is in a journey. Father, we thank you once again. Speak to us today, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, Jesus Christ, in some of his parables, and even in his personal ministry, would always mention about the Samaritans. Have you noticed that? It's either the religious people, it's either, you know, and then it's either the Samaritan. And these two groups of people during the time of Jesus Christ were always in contention. Uh, in fact, every time that the Jewish people or the, the religious people would come from Jerusalem and they would go to Jericho, they would actually um, circumvent or circle around to avoid um, you know, Samaria. It's because a lot of the concentration, the, the Samaritans, they live there. Now, you might ask the question, who are the Samaritans? 
Well, Samaritans claim that they are the Israelites, descendants of northern Israelite tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. These are the sons of Joseph. If you, if you remember that when they were coming out and they took the bones and Moses took them out and took the bones of Joseph and these two group of these, the sons, the descendants of the sons of Joseph stayed on the northern part of Israel. And they were, they, they were looked down uh, probably because they were mixed blood. They, they, don't, they feel that this, the Jewish people th- think that they were, they were not really a pure Jewish Israeli. So they were of mixed blood, and they were looked down upon by the Israelites, so they, they avoid them as much as they can. And Jesus often would use the topic about the Samaritans or the people of Samaria to expose the hypocrisy of the religious people or people in Jerusalem. Now, if you have been to Israel, let me tell you a little bit about Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem Israel is only as big as, uh, as uh, New Jersey, You know, between, I think, to the north, to the south, if you go all the way, it'll probably be about three hours drive, no traffic, if you take parkway. And that's how small uh, Israel is. And between Tel Aviv and and Jerusalem, they're quite uh, close. And what happens is, if you you stay inside Jerusalem, you see all these religious tourists, they come there, it's because they want to see all the historical and biblical sites of Jesus Christ, and based on what kind of religion they have, whether it's Muslim or, you know, or or, or Jewish or Christians. But if you move out of Jerusalem, you you recognize that Tel Aviv is just pretty much the Tel Aviv, it's it's the metropolis. And there's a huge difference because when you go inside Jerusalem, everything is religious. And that's just the way how the people of Jerusalem behave even during the time of Jesus Christ. They consider themselves as religious elite. Uh, they, 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 they feel that because they, they do have their descendants of the, uh, of the, of the uh, prophets and they have read the Old Testament that they, they feel that they know better than anyone else around them. And so they look down upon the Samaritans. And Jesus Christ, whenever he would speak about Samaritan, he would always expose the hypocrisy of the people of Jerusalem or the religious people. Jesus would describe the very religious Jews as a bunch of whitewashed tombs, meaning to say they have all the settings, they have all the external components of being close to God, but inside of them, Jesus Christ said, you whitewashed tombs. In other words, uh, there's, there's a lot of filthiness in their hearts. They're just hiding them by their religious gestures. So for them to go to God is more of a more of showmanship. And so Jesus Christ created this story, and in this story, Jesus wanted to highlight the difference between religious, being religious, and being relational. Say with me, religious. Say with me, relational. Do you know that you could be religious and not have friends at all? Do you know that you could be religious and be so away from God? Do you know that you could be so religious but still be defined inside of you? Because religion was never preached by Jesus Christ. Nothing in the Bible, when it, during the time of Jesus Christ, said that you should be Protestant, or you should be Anglican, you should be Catholic, or you should be all of these kinds of denomination. He only said one thing, you must be born again. And Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ invited people into a relationship, not into a religious affiliation. So we need to be clear on that because religion will never take you into the next life. It is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. You know how far that is? If you drive modern day times, the Jericho and Jerusalem is only 52 minutes by drive, by car. And if you try to walk from Jericho to Jerusalem, it's only seven hours and I think about nine minutes. So it's really not that far. And, and, you know, and so within, within, that, say, within that geographical setting, uh, the story unfolds between Jerusalem and Jericho, where a man was violently robbed, stripped of his clothes, bleeding, and almost half dead. On the same route, three men happened to, bypass, to pass by and, you know, and saw the same individual lying by the side of the road, almost dead. Haven't you noticed that sometimes people come to church and when they come out, they have different perspective about the message? Sometimes you go to a theme park and some would say, well, I'd like the roller coaster. Someone would say, I like the swing. I'd like the, you know, I like the, joint, the burger joint. You know, and yet it is, it's, it's on the same theme park. 
people come to church and some they would like the worship, some would like the, you know, some would like the testimony, some would like the, you know, some of the corny jokes of the pastor, and some would like the, we all, but they all came to the same church, they came at the same time, and they, they you know, and they come out with different perspectives. Well, it's the same thing with this. They were all on the same road, and yet they see the same subject, a man bleeding to death, and yet they have different response and reactions to that. So we're going to break it down. Each of the men responded differently. The priest, he was a ranking religious individual, said this, By a chance a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, this is what he did. He crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. So that means to say he didn't even had a he did not even intend to really go next to that Samaritan person. He saw him from a distance and he saw that he was not this Israelite full blood. What he did was he went to the other side and just walked and went straight to his destination. Now here comes another religious individual. It's called the temple assistant. And this is what it says. A temple assistant woke over and, and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on by the other side. Now, this one is a little bit, there's a little bit of a tension here. He saw the lying, the, the bleeding guy, and what he did was he came close to him, checked him out if he was dead, or, and he saw that he was just gasping for breath. You know what he's, he probably said? He's going to make it. And he turned around and went back. It's because he probably think that there's a bigger transaction waiting for him to where his destination is. Now comes the third man, the despised Samaritan. And the Word of God says that that then a despised man came along and he saw the man. And here's what happened. He felt compassion for him. And going over to him, notice this, the other two went on the other side. From the one side of the road went to the other side. While this guy was on the other side of the road and saw the man. And there was compassion. And the word of God says he crossed over in order to have compassion and minister to the man. And then he put the man in his own donkey and took him to an inn. And when he took care of him, the next day, which, which indicates that he interrupted everything that he had to do on that day. He was supposed to make it on that same day to, you know, to, his, de- to his destination. But he took a, a day break, stayed with the guy, you know, uh, bandaged him, took care of him, washed his wounds, put him in a shelter, and for overnight observed the man. Upon waking up, he goes to the counter and he said, here's the money. He said, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. So he put him up for several days. And so what happened, so we have this question and challenge uh, in this parable. Jesus said this, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked, the man replied, The one you showed him mercy, then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. It's incredible because, you know, it's one thing to see an object, it's one thing to stare at it. The man seeing seeing the man bleeding, the, 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 the despised Samaritan started to have compassion and it just, it led him to do something about it. Now, there are a few lessons we can learn between the short distance between Jerusalem and Jericho. And we call this one Jerusalem to Jericho lessons. The first lesson we can learn from the story of these of this three men is this. Between Jerusalem and Jericho, a ministry is birth. Between Jerusalem and Jericho, a ministry is birth. The travel between Jerusalem to Jericho in modern times is likened to our daily routines. Do you know that there are only three places where all of us, for majority of our life, would spend house, job, church. If you go to the church, if you go church to church regularly, you live what we call triangular life. From that, your house, six days, five days, you go to your work, and then on Sunday, you go to church, and then come back to your house, and you do that 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. You live a what we call triangular life. And within that triangular life, 90% of what you do is what we call repetitions. Mundane things. Repetitive things. Things that you do on Monday, you will do them all the way to Saturday. A cup of coffee, a piece of donut, an oatmeal in the morning, lunch in a restaurant, going back again, changing the clothes, taking a shower, 
putting on your perfume, your sex, and putting the car. You know, all of these things, 90% of everything we do, pluses, are all repeti- uh, rep- repetition. So if you don't know your purpose in life, you end up in a place of what we call the deep sigh. Of what, you know, you wake up every day and you say, here we go again. Because you are trapped in a routine. You're trapped in a repetition. You're trapped in what we call familiarity of things. And if you don't have a greater purpose in life, those triangular life that you have will strangulate you. It will strangle you to the point that, what's the point of life? And so Jesus Christ continues to provoke us that there are certain things that are greater than the things that we do every day. But here's, here's the amazing thing. Between your triangular life and ministry could be birthed if you're sensitive to the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Many years ago in the 1970s when uh, there was, a, there was a, so, a cultural shift in America that has impacted the whole world. That's how influential the United States is. Even way back in the 60s and 70s in the, in the hippie movement where it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll in America. A young man, got, a young man who, was, who was on drugs uh, came and attended a, a, a concert, and it was a Jesus concert. And the young man came to know Jesus Christ, and he was in his 20s. And his name was Chuck Smith. And Chuck Smith, because he, he really had a powerful encounter with Jesus, decided to go to a church after his conversion in one of those meetings. So he attempted to go to a church. He went there, long hair, smelly, hippie. You know how hippies are. They don't take showers, right? They just go lie down and, uh, you know, uh, make love and war and all of these things that they do during those times. So he went there the way he is. He went there with long hair and, you know, and, and, and dirty jeans and uh, the ushers kicked him out of the church. It is because he was not wearing tie and suits during those, those times, not knowing that what they saw was a brown bag, but they never had the opportunity to see the gold inside the brown bag. Because at that moment, they, they pretty much prejudged him that this guy has come here and he's a heroin addict or you know, he's into, into drugs and he's all this crazy lifestyle. So, and so what happened is that he, he never finished the service and he went out. But see, God is gracious. Chuck Smith continued with his walk with the Lord. He is the founding pastor of Calvary Network of Churches. Thousands of over the world. And he tells the story that how, at times we behave like the people of Jerusalem, of religious people, that we tend to push people on the other side of life because they don't smell like us, they don't look like us, their skin color is different from us, uh, their, their point of reference, their social status is different from us. And so we tend to judge them and put them from a distance from us. But see, if you are sensitive enough that between Jerusalem and Jericho is a ministry could be birth. I uh, remember in the early years here in the United States in the 90s, we were living in a small apartment. We were packed in the apartment. We have other, other Filipino ladies that have come and live with us. It's because they just arrived from the Philippines. Now, from time to time, we'd welcome people that are, you know, that are undocumented, and they, they would say, you know, I don't have a place to go, and we would say, you know, you can stay in our living room from time to time, and they would sleep there, and we would eat together. I would even transport them to their jobs. And so, you know, we, uh, what I would do is we gather all their laundry once a week, and I will take Wilton with me, and I would go to one of these laundry, uh, laundry uh, shops here. I came across a guy who was on the same day doing a laundry, and we started talking. And he began to tell me that every certain day he would be there. You know what I did? Every time, let's assume that it was like, I forget the day, but Tuesday, I would gather all my, my laundry, and on the same hour, on that same day, I would pretend as if like, I was like a coincidence that I was there, and there he was. And I would, you know, I would talk to Ricky. We had a cup of coffee, and one thing led to another. I began to share the Word of God. And then I never saw him again. 15, 20 years later, he came across me. I think that was in, during the, the, the memorial service of Brother Rob right here. He came to me and he said to me, Pastor Ness, you remember when you used to talk to me on that laundromat 25 years ago? I said, yeah. I will never forget that moment, he said. Because you would always come to me and have the word of God 
you know, because I realized that in, in my triangular life, you, God can always use you, whether in the laundry room or when you're pumping gas on your Wawa or whatever kind of gas station, there's all, you're always coming across certain people that if you're being sensitive between your Jerusalem and Judea, a ministry could be birthed unless you decide to ignore and behave like the other people. You know, I remember when the, when the church was still a very small church, we were like about 30 people. And I said to Sister Walma, it's taking too long. And I have so much hours, I said, during the day. Maybe I could do something. And I, I went to work in a factory in Lakewood. And most of the people there are Hispanic. And I'm the only Asian. I was there probably for less than a year. Took a, a, a graveyard shift, 11 to 6 o'clock, just to really preoccupy my time. And in, during those times that I stayed there, I came across a, a, a black young, per, a, a young man. And his name was Mike. And we became good friends. And he, would, he, has, a, he has a Walkman. He would play a lot of uh, his own secular songs. And you know what I did? I took some of the Christian songs that I have. And I said, hey, Mike, can we switch? I like what you're, what you're listening to. So we would swap. Well, you know, it's like, so I, I gave him the Christian song. And I, he gives me the secular song. We would listen. Of course, you know, that, that's already been prayed up. So I know it's going to minister to him. Next thing you know, he wanted to have a cup of coffee with me during our break. Well, as days went by, as months went by, he began to become transparent with me. He said to me that, you know, uh, you know Brother Nestor, he said, when I was a young boy, my, grand, my grandma used to take me to Sunday school. You know, he said, until I was 12 and my, my parents took me away and, you know, that was it. But I, do, I, I used to go to church, and I love going to church. I said, whatever happened, Mike? He said, well, things got in the way. You know, I went out, and I went to college, and a lot of things happened. And now I got two, uh, three kids. He said, I'm living with my girlfriend. And so we became good friends during those months. And we began to, and I began to pray for Mike. On the day that I felt that my, day, my, my, my season is over in that factory, I went to Mike. I said, Mike, let me tell you this. I said, you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, Brother Nestor, I know. Months go by. Someone calls me and he says, Brother Nestor, this is Mike. He said, I know that you left the factory for, uh, you know, for a while now. Just want to let you know that I took your advice. I said, what advice did I give you, Mike? He said, to marry my girlfriend. Today, as I'm calling you, he said, we just went to the, we went, went to the uh, municipality and uh, we got married. But that's good, Mike. It doesn't have to be a huge ministry. You just have to be obedient to the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be a pastor with a pulpit to be able to have a ministry of your own. Wherever you are, your platform is not this. Your platform is your heart. Whether you are in the supermarket, you're in the gas station, you, you know, you're talking to your neighbor, you know, you will always sense that every person that you come across, they have needs. They just don't want to express it. They just, want, they just don't want to confess it, but they do have needs. You just have, to be, you just have to be sensitive and open and be courageous enough and say, can I pray with you? Hallelujah. Are you there with me? The second lesson is be open to transformational interruptions. Say with me, transformational. You have to be open to the transformational interruptions. There are a lot of things that would interrupt your life. Problems can interrupt your life. Losing a job can interrupt your life. Um, you know, divorce can interrupt your life. Inflation can interrupt your life. God can interrupt your life. Listen to this. One day, a poor boy who was selling goods from door to door to pay his way through school found he had only one thin dime left, and he was hungry. He decided he would ask for a meal at the next hour, or next house. However, he lost his nerve when a lovely young woman opened the door. Instead of a meal, he asked for a drink of water. She thought he looked hungry, so brought him a large glass of milk. He drank it slowly and then asked, how much do I owe you? You don't owe me anything, she replied. Mother has taught us never to accept payment for a kindness. He said, did I thank you from my heart? And as Howard Kelly left that house, he not only felt stronger physically, but his faith in God and man was strong also. He had been ready to give up and quit. 
Years later, the young woman became critically ill. The local doctors were baffled. They finally left her to the big, uh, sent her to the big city where they called in a specialist to study her rare disease. Dr. Howard Kelly was called in for the consultation. When he heard the name of the town she came from, a strange light filled up his eyes. Immediately, he rose and went down to the hall of the hospital to her room. Dressed in his doctor's gown, he went in to see, him, to see her. He recognized her at once. He went back to the consultation room, determined to do his best to save her life. From that day, he gave special attention to the case. After a long struggle, the battle was won. Dr. Kelly requested the business office to pass the final bill to him for approval. He looked at it, then wrote something on the edge, and bill was sent to her room. She feared to open it, for she was sure it would take the rest of her life to pay for it all. Finally, she looked, and something caught her attention on the side as she read these words, paid in full with one glass of milk, signed Dr. Howard Kelly. Tears of joy flooded her eyes as her happy heart prayed, thank you, God, that your love has spread abroad through the human hearts and hands. You know, there are transformational interruptions in our lives. If you, you, know, if you only allow the Spirit of God to lead you and to guide you and to inspire you, and if you only ask the Spirit of God to open up His little eyes and ears and mind every day, there are many divine appointments and divine interruptions that God not only can use you, but you could be a blessing. You know, some become a, you know, destiny moment. Some are just a ministry of the moment. Remember, I, I taught you about moms, ministry of the moment. I taught you as well about what we call pastoring the moment. No and sense and how to relate with people and to talk to people and sensing where they're coming from. And at the end, you can always say, listen, I, I hear that there's such, a, there's such a lot of commotion in your life. Would you allow me to pray with you? And nine out of ten people will always would say, I don't mind being prayed for, being prayed over, please. Especially in a, in a, in a season where we're in, where you know, people are dying, people are getting sick, the economy is sick. Our society is sick. Our community is sick. Our politics is sick. Uh, you know, there's so many. Where, where, where are you at? That's where God is going to use you. Just be open to anything that, you know, that would interrupt you because sometimes when, when you are open to transformational interruption, it may delay your journey going to Jericho or going to Jerusalem, but the subject is greater than your destination. Are you there with me? Listen to this. Jesus was interrupted by Nicodemus at night at that moment he got born again. Jesus was interrupted by a woman with the issue of blood. Healing took place at that moment. Jesus walking in the side of the road was interrupted by Zacchaeus. His entire family got saved. Jesus was interrupted during dinner time by Mary Magdalene. She prepared Jesus for the coming crucifixion. Jesus Christ has exemplified this to us whenever that she has a big subject, but he has, an, he, he, he has an immediate subject right here. He's on his way to minister to something or to someone. There's always an interruption, and he would always take the time and minister to the moment. And next thing you know, signs and wonders and miracles follows that. You have to be open. You have to be open to transformational interruption. The third one is this. Our belief must be accompanied by the right behavior. You know, one of the things that turns off a lot of people about people that come to church is this. We have a belief, but we have the wrong behavior. The millennials who are, who are 35 years below, or some of them are thinking about 37, about only 2% of them be believe on biblical worldview. In other words, 98% of the young generation, some of them come to church. They don't believe on the existence of God. They probably socially or culturally would like to come to church because it's where they grew up. Our parents used to take us to this church. I used to see the priest. I used to see the clergy. I used to see the reverend. I used to see the pastor. So they come, but they're totally distant from God. And one of the things that turns them off a lot of times is this. We know that you believe in God, but we can see the God in you. Mahatma Gandhi, when he, when he was a radical revolutionary against the British colonizers of India, was exiled in South Africa. 
He was struggling with his religion of Hinduism. At a young age, so probably about mid-20s, he was struggling with his own belief. So he said, let me just go and try this Anglican church or Protestant. He went to Protestant church. And the moment they saw that he was, a, he was Indian, he was, he was Hindu, they, the ushers stopped him. And they said, you're not allowed to come in because you're not a Christian. And of course, you know the story. Mahatma Gandhi went back to India and he became the leader of the, you know, the, the, the largest number of people in the world. I think right now they number about 1.3 billion people. Now, can you imagine if Mahatma Gandhi at the age of 25 or 24 entered into that and they have the right behavior and he came and he heard the word of God and he heard the gospel and God changed his heart and he would go to India. Can you just imagine by, the, by our history, by this time, probably India would have been at least one-third to one-fourth Christianized. It is because of the leadership influence that he has. Only if that pe those people were able to see the divine interruption that was taking place and only if they had the proper behavior. Amen? This Thanksgiving and Christmas, you will be going out and having parties. You better behave inside those parties. You better distinguish yourself from other, other people so that people can see that even if you go to the parties, you're not really sinning with them. I'm not saying that you should not go to parties. You should go. Jesus Christ, His first miracle was in the wedding. It was in a drinking session. But Jesus Christ knows his spot. He knows his purpose why he was there. And so he was able to change the water into wine. Well, God calls us into that place. It is because God wants us to change you know, the lives of people into the other side of life. And we need to have to be able to develop that kind of Jesus-like and Jesus matter and Jesus character and Christ-like attitude wherever we go. The way we speak. The way we talk to other people. The way we reconcile, the way we apologize, the way yesterday I, w I went out and had a breakfast, a brunch with a young man in this church because he's a potential leader. And I said to him, I haven't seen you for a quite a while. And he said, because pastor, I, I, I feel like, uh, I don't know, he said, and I, I could sense that he was holding a grudge. And I said, you know, until you let go of what you're sensing in your heart, I said, your territory will shrink farther. I noticed that, Pastor, he said. I said, you know, you're not jolly, you're not happy, you're not spontaneous. I said, you were, you, you, you were like that during the, you know, when, when in the past. And I told him, do you know what anger is, what bitterness is, and resentment is? What is the meaning? I said, no, Pastor, he said. Let me tell you this. Anger, resentment, I said, is an unmet need. Let me say this once again. Anger, resentment, or bitterness is an unmet need. You're angry because somebody offended you. You're, you're, you're resentful, it is because you did not like the behavior, and so it was unmet needs. You were expecting the way, you're something else, and then they came back with something negative, and it hurt you. And so when you're angry, when you're resentful, when you are, you know, when, when, you're, when you're avoiding people, it is because there is an unmet needs there. And we have to be redemptive when that happens because Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. You know, one of the things that, that, that really, 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 uh, you know, stumbles a lot of people is in the area of behavior. Jesus Christ said we are supposed to be the salt and the light of the earth. We are, and we will always be. That means to say you will always be a seasoning. You will always be a person that would enlighten other people's lives. Give them hope. Give them encouragement. You know, connect with them. Relate with them. Pray with them. All of these things. God has given us all the capacity by His grace and mercy and by the anointing that God has placed over us. You are more than conquerors. You are more than a church goer. You're more than a Sunday person that comes to this huge building and say, well, I love God. Well, you love God, not only on Sunday, but Monday to Friday. Let's all live it out. God does, is not calling us to be perfect, but He's calling us to be obedient. Hallelujah. You know, the hurts and pain and hopelessness and disillusionment, fear and discouragement you see in the life of people will shape the content of your heart. It will shape the content of your heart. 
The kingdom of God is not about intelligence or a great knowledge or high recognition. The, internal, the eternal kingdom of God is about heart issues. Now let me tell you this. One of the hardest things that you do when you serve God is when you pioneer a church. When this church was just probably about 20, 30 people, I would scour the motels all over. And one day I came across a man who was on a wheelchair. I saw him. He was struggling with his wheelchair right on the side of the road. And I, and I had a chance to get to know him. And we became good friends, and I would go and visit him in this old American motel back here in 37. And I said, Phil, I'd like you to come to church. And he said, I can't come to the church, Brother Nestor. I said, why? It is because he said, I have a bed sore. You know, I've been, he was an amputee. And, and so because he's been using the wrong uh, arm, uh, wheelchair, he had a, uh, a sore, uh, open sore uh, on his back. So I was just thinking like, ah. Oh. Okay, let me, you know what? I have a solution. I will take Sister Wilma with me. She's the nurse. So we went to the door and said, Phil, we got a solution for you to come to church. He said, what is that, Brother Nestor? I said, Sister Wilma is going to take care of your open wound. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. I said, no, I'll go out. You know, she's a nurse. So in other words, she allowed Sister Wilma, and then we brought Sister Mina, and they, they would take turns like two or three times a week. And we would go there. And then, until you get well, I said. And when he got well, and he's more confident to come to the church, start coming. And one of that day, one of that Sunday, he wheeled himself to the altar and gave his heart to Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because of an open sore. <laughs> You know, it's, let me tell you, you know, looking back now, it's, it's joyful. <laughs> Hallelujah. I remember ministering in the Lakehurst Motel at 2 o'clock in the morning. Cops came and just arrest, you know, and just, they, they pretty much sandwiched me. And they said, get out of the van now. At 2 o'clock in the morning, I said, officer, what did I do? Get out and we'll talk to you. And, you know, with your hands up, back up like this and against the wall. They frisked me and, they, and they said, Two o'clock in the morning, we've been watching you. You've been coming to that motel for at least three times a week. That is a drug-infested area. We suspect that you're a, you know, you're a drug dealer and you're just using the church van, he said, you know, as a front. I said, well, you can press me. You can look at it. There's a lady here. He said, I'm just about to bring her to her mobile home. She's been living there under welfare, and she found a mobile home. And look at her stuff. I said, we don't believe you. So, you know, they, they investigated, and I was clean, and they let me go. But on the, during those times when I would go to that hotel, I would hold a Bible study with a gay couple, someone that had HIV, a, a Korean girl that, 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 you know, that ran away from parents, addicted to heroin and cocaine, and we have a bunch of people and we have a, we have a Bible study there. And let me tell you this, out of that Bible study, that, yeah, that, that gay couple came to church and both of them accepted Jesus Christ. Our love must be accompanied by a right behavior. Last but not the least, love people where they're at. Love people where they're at. Don't tell them that when you come to our church, God will change you. No, where they're at, you love them until God changes them where they're at. Jesus ministered the least in the temple and among the religious people because of the hardening of their hearts. The religious pride prevented them from receiving lessons from the son of a carpenter. Let me end this with this story. The servant's reward. One day, when you are in heaven, someone will come up to you and thank you for the way you touched their life with hope and encouragement. The person's words will take you by surprise. Soon another person will seek you out, and then another, and then another. And as you listen to each one's story, you will begin to discover all the ways that God used your life when you were completely unaware of it. You will find it was not only through the big things you did, but also through the small things, through a spoken word that was not planned, a spontaneous act of kindness, a loving attitude, or a simple prayer of concern. To your joy, you will discover that in all these ways and more, God used you to deposit eternal measure of His love into many needy hearts. And let me tell you, we live in a broken world. People are, they need the Lord. And I hope and pray that as you go, you will do the same, just like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We would do the same. Stand up with me, please.
Father, we, Lord Jesus, you, you told us this story not to tickle our ears or articulate our minds, but to really confront us with the issue of compassion and our behavior. We just ask and pray, Lord Jesus, by the work of the Holy Spirit, that you give us the heart, Lord God, of this despised Samaritan, that we don't go and cross over away from the needs and the concerns and the pain and discouragement and disillusionment, Lord God, of people. But God, cause us to be attracted to the brokenness of people because that's who you are, Jesus. You came to this world because you are attracted to the wickedness and brokenness and hopelessness of people so that you can be a redeemer. Jesus, would you give us that heart? That we will not be intimidated by the darkness of this world. In fact, we will shine brighter so that we can intimidate the darkness of this world. We ask and we pray all of this, Almighty God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I would like you to please uh, lift up your hands. And to those of you that would like to pray with someone, we have our leaders here in the front after our benediction. They would like to pray and agree with you. I don't want you to leave this church, the presence of God, without your concern being met. The book of Hebrews said this, For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for Him and how you have shown your love to Him by caring for other believers as you still do. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. May God bless you all. May the face of God shine over us all. And may the grace and mercy be overwhelming, overflowing upon our lives. God bless you all. Please join us. There's coffee, connect, and conversation.